Good evening, everybody. <laughs> I'm Tim Browse, and I'm Mayor Pro Tem tonight. Jeff Jacobs is out of town. Uh, on behalf of the City of St. Louis Park, I want to welcome you all here. Uh, the City of St. Louis Park has a long history of leading the way on environmental stewardship, and the Council's consideration of a policy regulating single-use plastic bags in the city is the latest example of that. Also in the St. Louis Park spirit, we are following a process to consider a policy that allows for ample education on the issue as well as public input before the Council makes any decisions. We're pleased tonight to have the opportunity to hear from a wide variety of people representing varied points of views regarding single-use plastic bags. And for the Council to ask questions of these experts, this learning experience will help the Council and City staff in shaping policy options for consideration this fall. For those of you in the audience who have an interest in this issue, thank you for being here tonight. We hope you'll also find the panel interesting and informative. Uh, please note that tonight's session is not a public hearing, so we won't be taking any comments or questions from the audience. By September, the Council will have some ideas about the shape a single-use plastic bag policy may take, and a public hearing will be held to take any and all comments regarding any proposed policies. We're also going to be following a similar process for proceeding to consider a policy regarding polystyrene food packaging containers. So watch for more information on that on the city's website. We should have a similar experts panel like this next month. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's panel discussion, Blois Olson is the principal and founder of Fluence Media, which specializes in media and communication strategy, data visualization and insights, content creation and distribution, and marketing. Among many other honors throughout his career, Blois was named one of 200 Minnesotans you should know by <laughs> Twin Cities <laughs> Business Magazine, so now you all know him. <laughs> Blois is also a St. Louis Park resident, and we're very pleased to welcome him here tonight to act as our moderator. Thanks, Tim, um, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, welcome. I, uh, I just want to introduce myself and give a couple disclaimers. I am a St. Louis Park City resident, um, and I am here in my citizen capacity. Uh, so even though my daily work has, at times, involved being a paid consultant in situations like that for both municipalities and business uh, and nonprofit organizations tonight, I am just here as a citizen, happy to give back to my city. Um, I want to just let you know kind of how we're going to go about tonight. Uh, we have a long list of experts to provide us input. Um, and we're going to start uh, with someone on the phone. So we would beg your patience to listen carefully uh, to Scott Dibbett of uh, Corvallis, Oregon. We will then move to government experts from both the state and the county, then business organizations, and then uh, environmental groups. Um, again, just to reiterate what Councilmember Rossen said, is this is really to inform council and staff of various positions. This is a discussion uh, and a Q&A. This is not a debate. Um, and if you have input, I would just like to kind of outline that, as Councilmember Rossen said, uh, in September, there will likely be a public hearing, but there is a long, thoughtful process for uh, the public to engage here. So if you're watching on uh, public access or you're hearing about this, um, know that there's going to be plenty of places for the public to provide input as well. Uh, and so with that, um, I would just uh, last uh, let you know that um, uh, the council will ask questions. As much as I will moderate the participants, I will also try to moderate the council and your <laughs> questions so that you don't get to dominate uh, all the questions away from your colleagues. And I would never suggest that that would happen in a public environment, but maybe once or twice I watch the legislature. Um, uh, and so with that, do we have uh, Mr. Dibbeg on the phone? Yes, I'm here. I hear a lot of feedback, though. Mr. Vic, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, hear you. thanks, Scott. Um, uh, let me just introduce Scott. Uh, Scott Dibvad, Dibvad is sustainability program specialist for the city of Corvallis, Oregon. 
has provided expertise and leadership on organizational sustainability since 2010. In 2012, he guided the Corvallis community through a very public process to reduce the use of single-use shopping bags. Prior to his work with the city, Scott served as a principal of a leading sustainability research and consulting firm, serving over 75 clients in higher ed, government, nonprofit, and the private sector. He has taught community college courses in sustainable business and development. He's originally from Des Moines, Iowa, and attended the University of Iowa before graduate school at the University of Oregon. In a fun way, Scott, welcome back to the Midwest. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, it's uh, One thing in the sustainability community is the amount of sharing of information that happens. And um, I relied on a lot of communities when we were going through the process um, for their expertise and uh, sort of how they navigated these waters. And so I am um, I'm happy to give back in that respect. Um, I am going to just kind of share our story. I don't mind being interrupted. If there's something that's unclear, um, you know, please let me know. And uh, I understand there's room for questions at the end. So we'll see how it goes. Um, in 2011, uh, a group of community members brought to city council draft of an ordinance um, that essentially banned plastic, uh, single-use plastic bags from all retail establishments in the city. Um, this was supported by the Northwest Grocers Association, um, which is which a, a, a strong um, show of support. Um, but they, they required, that, required that it provide a level playing field for all businesses, no matter uh, what type or what they sold, uh, big or small. Um, Corvallis has a really strong uh, public process to local government, and um, and this plastic bag ban was definitely uh, subjected to that. The um, city staff, mainly myself, uh, kind of led that process, uh, it, which consisted of uh, work sessions with parties who represented at the initial council meeting, uh, and it was really up to them to identify options for reducing the use of single-use plastic bags. And then we conducted some uh, uh, broader stakeholder input, um, mainly organizations or businesses that would be directly affected, um, including local retail networks like our um, Corvallis Independent Business Alliance, the Farmers Market, uh, things like that. And then also uh, external organizations with expertise on the project or on the subject, anyways, uh, groups like uh, we have an Oregon Surfrider Foundation, which is very concerned about um, maintaining ocean health, and plastic bags can contribute to, to the demise of that. Um, and they were very active and interested participants. And those volunteer organizations and other groups were key in, in moving this forward. We, um, as staff, facilitated three stakeholder meetings to identify and develop options, essentially, for reducing the use of these uh, single-use plastic bags. And uh, we'd meet with community groups. We'd go back, report to city council, and, uh, you know, get some guidance along the way and, and um, just basically report what we were hearing from the public. Um, and then, you know, in the end, what we came up with was, was not support for a ban on plastic bags that does not include a fee on paper bags. So uh, in, what we heard in other communities was that uh, if they banned plastic bags without a fee on paper, consumers simply shifted to paper, and that cost retailers a lot more. Uh, the price of plastic bags can be anywhere from one and a half cents to maybe three cents for the, the thin T-shirt type bags, and, and paper bags can be three to five times more expensive. So the uh, Northwest Grocers Association strongly represented uh, retail businesses on that end is that, you know, they didn't really want to see an increased cost to this. So our, our ordinance, so that, that was brought to council late 2011. The ordinance went into effect on January 1st of 2013. And it, it went into effect in two, two stages. Um, the first stage, starting January 1st, was for retail businesses with more than 50 full-time equivalent employees at their Corvallis location. And then uh, all other retail outlets uh, were affected by the ordinance starting on July 1st, 2013. So they had six months essentially to 
the, the bigger stores have more outlets. If, if, if our Safeway grocery store here can't use plastic bags, they can ship them to another store almost anywhere in the U.S. Smaller businesses don't have that opportunity. Uh, so we gave them a little bit more time to react and adjust. Our, our ordinance essentially says um, at checkout or the point of sale. So that, that's really key language for us is that what happens, uh, this ordinance only affects what happens at checkout or the point of sale. Uh, Single-use plastic carryout bags are prohibited, and customers must be charged a minimum of five cents for any barrel size paper bag. Uh, and that's something that got changed along the way, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But barrel size bags are essentially the large grocery bags that most grocery stores uh, use to to pack the big groceries in. The ordinance here in Corvallis applies to all re- retail establishments except. Uh, restaurants within city limits. And then for, uh, we define thick plastic bags, which is 2.25 mils or greater. Those can be considered reusable and may be provided at checkout with or without a charge. It's up to the retailers. Those bags are more expensive. They can charge, they can charge for any bag they want, essentially. They have to charge for the, the, pap- uh, the, the barrel size paper bag provided at checkout. And then um, I, I guess the other key element is that plastic bags that are provided at a time other than checkout are allowed. So um, uh, bulk bags, um, uh, bags that you might put your bulk goods in, you might put your produce or meat in, those things, as long as they happen away from checkout, they can, uh, it's okay. So one, So we went through this public process that lasted about, uh, 13 months, and um, a lot of it was about preparing the community um, and stores. Well, uh, initially, a lot of it was about getting input on the um, on the ordinance itself, tweaking it. Um, you know, listening to what the community uh, prioritized. Uh, once we got that final version, it, it turned to preparing the community and the stores for the upcoming change. It was, it was vital that we had um, the involvement of community members and groups who supported the bag bag, bag ban, uh, especially around educating the community, because this really uh, just extended the ability of staff to conduct outreach in the community. They hosted a number of high-profile events, like a, they had a logo contest, uh, they had make-your-own-bag classes, uh, reusable bag design contest. And those things were, uh, I wouldn't say there was real high participation in those things, but they really generated a lot of publicity and interest and just awareness around that ordinance. Um, And um, Corvallis is home to Oregon State University. We have a large student population here in the community, which is transitional. You know, every four, five, or six years, you essentially get a new batch of, uh, of students who aren't aware of our bag ban and um, and so it's important that the college be involved in you know and kind of helping the students understand the local community a little bit better. Um, during the first week of the bag ban, so this is essentially the first week of January in 2013. Those all those community members and volunteers helped by staffing the parking lots of the affected stores. And uh, I should. I should tell you, in Corvallis, this was about 11 stores that were immediately impacted by the ordinance with, uh, because they had over 50 full-time equivalent employees. So volunteers staffed those parking lots for that first initial week, uh, busy times of the day, and just to alert customers to that the ordinance was now in effect, um, things that they could do to um, avoid a nickel charge on a bag. Um, so just that... Uh, that active outreach was really important. Um, and also the, the local press. We, uh, we have no TV stations located here in Corvallis, but there are some nearby. And um, so they were slightly involved, but really it was our local newspaper um, that did a lot of reporting around it. Obviously it was, a, um, it was a topic of great interest in the community, and so that the higher-profile nature of the ordinance led to increased reporting in local media 
they ran several stories on the topic, including around the logo contest or the bag design contest. And uh, we really developed a relationship with the primary reporter on this to make sure that they were getting the story right. Things um, from the beginning of the ordinance being brought to council to the to the end when a final version was finalized, it changed. It changed considerably. There, yeah, I guess uh, you know there there were several tweaks along the way, and so just making sure that the community understood wh- what page we were on now in this ordinance was uh, really important, so that you know people were on the same page about what they were uh, coming to expect. In Corvallis, we have a very hands-off approach to the businesses in the community. There's no licensing or registration. There's no fees. There's no real relationship with city government that retail businesses have. So the idea of the city collecting the nickel fee was off the table from the start. Just the administrative um, effort to uh, try to collect that fee from all the businesses in the community was more than city council wanted to um, wanted to bite off. Um, over, uh, we uh, we sent about uh, there are about 370 retail establishments in Corvallis at the time. We sent letters with information and resources about the new ordinance for both their employees and customers. Um, we had a we included a letter with information for business owners about the new ordinance a flyer that they could post to educate their employees and um, and several easily removable point of sale stickers for businesses to display near cash registers this kind of gave um, I'll get to this later but the the cashiers were the ones who really took the brunt of uh, of people's feelings around this and so any way that they can say it's not it's not me that's doing this. It's uh, you know they can point to that point of sale sticker and say it's a, it's a city new city ordinance and to sort of deflect the uh, the anger from them because I, I I felt terrible about how some of the stories I heard about how the uh, cashiers were uh, treated. And um, so once the ordinance went into play, um, we city staff were tasked with enforcement. The enforcement around this is uh, we don't go out and investigate unless we get a call from a community member. So we don't go we don't go look for problems around this. We let the community report those problems to us, and then we work to educate the business owner and and move them into compliance. We um, once enforcement began on January first, uh, we. We actively reached out to those 11 affected stores and store managers to gather feedback to better understand any difficulties they or their customers were having. Essentially, you know, we, we kind of use the big businesses to learn, uh, get us through this learning curve so that we could help the smaller businesses adjust more easily. Really, the consistent feedback that we heard was that Compliance, and this is just one weekend, uh, compliance with the ordinance was going well. A majority of customers had expressed really very little difficulty adjusting. Um, but most, more, most store managers stated that a few customers had strongly expressed their frustration with the ordinance. Um, the, through sort of the, the public process, how much to charge for a bag was, a big topic of debate. We we went from uh, some people wanted to charge as much as maybe fifty cents a bag, twenty five cents a bag. We settled on a nickel, and I really really believe that that was a wise decision. The nickel is enough to remind people, let people know that it's money out of their pocket if they don't bring a bag, um, but. Um, it's different than a quarter, charging a quarter for a bag, where that may really affect lower income households. Scott, um, oh, we're yes. coming up right about 15 minutes here, uh, so we'd okay. like to open up to questions for the Q and for the council. Uh, any final comments? Um, let's see. I feel like I've hit most of my 
things. We had a few updates along the way, um, mainly to limit the charge to only grocery grocery or barrel sized paper bags, and this focuses on the most t- common type of bag provided at checkout while exempting the less common bag types, which makes it for an easier adjustment for small businesses. Um, uh, I'd like to reiterate that cashiers are the face of this change, and they take the brunt of the complaints. Anything you can do to educate or prepare them for the transition will really helps the community adjust more quickly. They're the face, and they can really help to educate. And that was one area where we didn't spend a whole lot of time, or we didn't see that opportunity. Okay. Thanks. Scott, Councilmember Mavity, question? Yes. Um, I'm stuck a little bit on uh, your story and what we have, at least in our report, ends in 2013. So I'd like to understand a little bit more about the impact that the ban has had. And Mm -hmm. uh, have you measured the reduction of plastic bag usage and uh, any other metrics that you've used to see whether this has succeeded or not? We did early on when we were looking at how what... uh, Initially, council wanted a lot of um, reporting around this. We found that um, one of the largest grocery stores in town reported a 72% decrease in carryout bags provided to customers uh, at their one store, 72% decrease. um, And that's both paper and plastic combined compared to the year previous. Uh, And that equates to 5,200 fewer bags handed out per day at that one store. That's the only quantification we've really done. Other questions? Councilmember Spano. Scott, thanks so much. This is Jake Spano on the City Council here. Thanks so much for taking time uh, out of your day. It's 5 o'clock out there, and I'm sure you're eager to get home for the night. Uh, I've got a couple of quick questions. One was in the uh, materials staff provided us from Corvallis' website. Uh, and it mentioned non-recycled uh, paper bags. My assumption is is that this policy, so it applied to plastic bags and any bags, paper bags that were not made of recycled materials. Is that correct? We had a requirement, um, yes, in general. And we had a requirement of 40% post-consumer recycled content in all paper bags given away at uh, checkout. Uh, we limited that later to just the grocery or barrel size bags requiring 40% post-consumer recycled content because industry sort of adjusted to that and it's a very common practice. The smaller bags industry is not uh, necessarily there. It's harder for smaller businesses to find those 40% or greater post-consumer recycled content paper bags. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to get. I just wanted to make sure that I understood uh, that piece of it. Uh, the other item, and I don't know, Scott, if you have this in front of you, but the uh, Minnesota Restaurant Association uh, provided us with a letter. Dan McElroy, who's here in the audience and will be talking to us later, uh, mentions that um, <clears throat> some of the local. Uh, well, I'll just read from his letter. Some local bag ordinances in other states have exemptions for restaurants to use plastic bags. Uh, a few of the many cities with exemptions for restaurant uh, restaurants to use p- uh, plastic bags include Chicago, Santa Fe, and Corvallis. So I guess I would just curious if you could elaborate on what the decision was around that and what implications that has had for that. Sure, yeah, we uh, we did face that question. We uh, uh, Initially, the ordinance did include restaurants. After uh, quite a bit of uh, public process, it, we excluded restaurants from that uh, mainly because um, uh, part of the part of the decision making around that was the uh, as big a bang as we can out of this without putting it in jeopardy. Uh, restaurants often serve uh, foods that have liquids that can leak into bags. Paper bags are not going to suffice in that situation. Um, it was just considered to leave well enough alone with the restaurants. Focus on the where the large majority of bags go out to the public, of single-use black bags go out to the public and um, address that. Councilmember Sanger. Thank you. Um, this is Sue Sanger, another council member. My question is whether since you have implemented this ban or partial ban, whether the businesses in Corvallis have stepped up their efforts to encourage customers to bring their own uh, like cloth bags and or whether they have adopted programs 
to give money to charity um, in recognition of those uh, customers who do bring in cloth bags. Some stores, uh, just almost that next day, as soon as the ordinance went into effect, had a wide array of reusable bags for sale at their stores. Uh, several nonprofits uh, put together uh, reusable bag giveaways, especially focused on low income and senior community members. And um, so there has been there's been some effort, but not coordinated by the city. The city did the, the city stayed out of giving away reusable plastic or uh, reusable bags. Thank you. Comes from health. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, Scott. This is actually really helpful, at least to me. I'm ho I can see a lot of my council members nodding and just you know <laughs> taking this in. Um, Interestingly enough, when uh, there was an article in our Star Tribune newspaper about us considering this, and that's really what we're doing, is we're talking about it and getting more information and considering it, um, all of a sudden, my friends started texting me pictures of plastic bags and trees and pictures of plastic bags on fences and <laughs> so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing them everywhere as I was driving. So my question to you is, um, anecdotally, is... Are, have you noticed, is it noticeable the lack of trash and litter, litter of these plastic bags throughout Corvallis? Well, it, it's interesting. I really noticed it a lot when we were having the discussion, all the plastic bags <laughs> um, around. And um, it, I, I'd say that's really hard to measure. Right. Uh, we, the, the main gist from our council was to reduce the use of single-use objects. That, that, that was sort of the, the big picture around this. Uh, there were other benefits, uh, the litter factor, the potential to clog storm drains, the, uh, re, the use of uh, fossil fuels for a single-use item. Uh, those things were part, really more the bigger picture. And uh, so it, it's, I mean, obviously we we do not see many bags in trees anymore because you got to drive ten miles away to get a plastic bag, um, unless you get it from a gro uh, from a restaurant, I guess. But um, but obviously, just having fewer of those things in the community, they're a very mobile um, uh, pollutant, I guess, and um, and so they they're highly visible and they do get around. But uh, I guess uh, just uh, you know, I would say yes, there are fewer of them, but. Um, it's really hard to quantify on that in that sense. Thanks. Uh, we're going to have a couple more questions here. First from Councilmember Brosson, and then we'll go to Councilmember Mavity again. Uh, thank you. What was the rationale behind exempting employers that had less than 50 employees? They weren't exempted. It was just a delay. They delayed for six months. It was, yeah, it was just a delay to give them more time to, uh, to adjust. Yeah, big businesses, uh, you know, our, our bigger grocery stores have, uh, tend to be national chains. They can send their bags to uh, any other community and have them used there while they, you know. So it was a much easier adjustment for So now businesses. it's a universal ban? Now it's universal, yes. All right, and the other question I had was pharmacies. Why were they exempting? Pharmacies, um, it was, well, again, it was small potatoes, essentially, and they tend to, uh, but there were privacy issues around that. I don't remember too clearly uh, about that, but that, I think, was part of the ordinance when it first came to us, and I, I think that was in uh, from language from another community, and it just seemed to make sense around the privacy issue. Okay. Councilman Yes, thank you again. Uh, quick last question. As we're doing this, uh, there does not appear to be any other mus municipalities within Minnesota that have done this yet, but there's another one, a big one, next to us that's thinking about it. And my question to you <laughs> is, uh, did you have other municipalities either nearby or within the state that were considering this at the same time, and are there currently different bans that different cities have? Are they approaching this in a different way? And how has that worked out for the uh, industry and, and in general? Um, I, I will say my interest in plastic bag bans greatly diminished once ours went into place. <laughs> and so I haven't followed up too closely. I know, this, I, I know statewide there's, they're considering it. The, the thing that has impacted people more is when um, the smaller grocery chains that tend to serve uh, smaller towns, uh, uh, there, there's one in particular that banned or that said we're no longer using plastic bags and um, and 
just to see the ripple effects of that in those communities has been pretty significant. I, I think, you know, there's just a level of awareness raising that happens when a store uh, makes a move like that and customers start to wonder, well, why, I wonder why they did that. Um, and so people get to be asking those questions in their head. Uh, there were, we, we are, uh, we're about 10 miles from the closest community, and so we, we didn't have border issues where people could just go. We heard threats that, um, that people would start doing their grocery shopping in another community, and that may or may not have happened. We haven't seen any real repercussions from that, but it's, you know, when it's when a bag is a nickel and you're and a gallon of gas is three or four dollars, it it doesn't make a whole lot of financial sense. But it is sort of a um, uh, an issue that people uh, vote with their wallet, I guess, and to some extent. But we didn't have border issues like you might have there. Thank you. Uh, no other questions I see from council. Um, thank you very much, Scott. Happy to help. All right, great. We'll move on to the next part of the presentations here from our state uh, and county solid waste agencies. Uh, I'd like to introduce Madeline Chochi from the Minnesota Pollution, Pollution Control Agency and Paul Croning from the Hennepin County Environment and Energy Department. And I believe Madeline has a PowerPoint uh, and she'll kind of kick it off. All right. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, I have not implemented any such policy. <laughs> I am here representing the, um, the Pollution Control Agency, and really I'm gonna talk to you about what we know about the environmental impact of different <laughs> bags and some of the policy considerations you might wanna take um, as you're going through your deliberations. Um, so formally, the MPCA has no stance on this issue. Um, we don't see plastic bags as any different than any other plastics that need to be managed in the waste stream. Um, and we have other plastics that are kind of bigger fish to fry, frankly. Um, we are, however, generally supportive of policies that conserve resources, uh, that lower our total environmental impacts, um, or that push materials up the waste hierarchy. And what I mean by the waste hierarchy is on the screen there, and this is actually in statute as a goal for the state of Minnesota, um, that we prefer to reduce the material first, right? If we can prevent it, that's the best thing to do. Reuse is the next best, and then recycling. Uh, and then we go on to the disposal options. Um, there are a few ways that we do develop policies um, and that stakeholders can participate in our policy making, and I just thought I would share those quickly. Um, one is through the Solid Waste Policy Report, which is done every four years. Um, it's due this year in December. Another is the Metropolitan Solid Waste Policy Plan that'll next be done, um, and it'll be finished in late 2016. We should start taking input from stakeholders on that at the end of this year. Um, we are currently uh, working on a white paper specifically on these issues of product restrictions and product bans, in part because we were beginning to get asked by um, communities what our stance was on these issues. And so that should be done in the next month or so. And in that white paper, we make a couple of points, several of which I'll make this uh, right now. Um, but one of the big ones is to encourage, um, encourage policymakers to really think about the clarity of the goal of the policy. Um, so really know what it is you're trying to impact and why. Um, I think different goals will need different policy levers. If you are looking to increase your recycling rate, for instance, um, frankly, if you increase the use of paper bags, they weigh more, that's going to make your recycling rate look better, <laughs> right? But that may not be the best for a total environmental footprint. Um, if you are most concerned about litter, then looking at plastic bags may be uh, an important place to look, but so may bottles or fast food wrappers, uh, containers. You know, I don't know what your litter audit might look like. So that's an important piece. Um, and then the choice of target. In the white paper, we, can, we ask uh, policymakers to think about, you know, are you looking at bags because it's in the newspaper? Or are you looking at bags because it's an important part of your waste stream? Have you considered other parts of the waste stream for policy targeting as well? Um, you know, compared to something like construction and demolition debris, um, 
plastic bags, all bags really are a, a very modest piece of the waste stream. So just things to be thinking about. Um, we also uh, really encourage looking at things, uh, policies like this from what we call a life cycle perspective. It takes materials, a lot of resources to make things, to make stuff. And so we look at this life cycle uh, of, a, of a product where it needs to be, materials need to be extracted. Um, they need to be then manufactured, distributed, they get used carrying our groceries from the store, and then eventually something happens to them at the end of life. And we tend in everyday, um, in everyday life to really give a lot of credence to the end of life, whether it gets recycled or whether it gets um, disposed of in a landfill, because that's what's very visible. But what we know from the last 10, 15 years of research um, is that the bigger part of the impact is what happens beforehand. So it's all, most the lion's share of the impact is really in the production of the bag, all right? So with that in mind, uh, looking at things this way shows us some surprising things. Um, and one of the most surprising things is that um, plastic uses fewer resources overall from start to finish uh, than paper. And so this I uh, took from uh, uh, life cycle analysis done in 2011 to just make it very plain. Um, comparing 1,500 plastic bags to 1,000 paper bags because they hold different amounts, so those are equal sort of carrying capacity. Um, and you can just see that the plastic bags have less total energy in them, less fossil fuel, um, less municipal solid waste, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, much less water use in the production of them, and just less weight overall. Uh, reuse is very important to consider when you're considering these policies. Um, and I will give you an example before I even talk about this graph. Um, in Ireland, where they passed a bag fee, you may be familiar with this, um, they passed bag fees on both kinds of bags, paper and plastic. Um, they started out, I think, at 15, equivalent of 15 cents, and then have gradually moved up to 35 cents. What they found is that when it hit 35 cents, people started buying trash bags <laughs> because they had been reusing their plastic bags as trash can liners in large amounts. Mm -hmm. And so the plastic bags were getting reused in large amount. And <laughs> so when they passed this ban, one of the unintended and unexpected consequences was that the sales of other plastic bags, thicker and bigger plastic bags, actually went up by, I've seen different reports, but about 400%. Um, so it's just interesting to think about that. Uh, reuse is really important, and all bags do better the more they're reused, all right, including plastic bags, true for all of them. So what this chart represents is the number of uses after which a reusable bag is better than a plastic bag in terms of global warming, all right, in terms of that one environmental outcome. So. The, on the left-hand column, that's your normal single-use plastic bag. That's what you're talking about here this evening and not reused. So that one bag, I'd, ha I'd need to use a paper bag three times. Um, the regular polypropylene bag, sort of uh, like, like the one I was modeling before for Jamie. Um, you'd have to use that one 11 times or a cotton shopping bag 131 times um, to get the benefit of the one plastic bag, so to, to ex exceed the global warming uh, potential. So really, I mean, if you look at that, 11 uses from the polypropylene kind of reusable bag, which is pretty commonly sold in most of our stores these days um, as the reuse alternative, um, most people probably would use it way more than 11 times. And after 11 times, it's all environmental gravy, right? It's all beneficial. So once you use a plastic bag uh, as a trash liner, the second column represents using about half, 40% of them as a trash can liner, you can see that now you have to use the other kinds of bags more <laughs> to get the environmental benefit. Is that making sense? Um, if you use all of your plastic bags, single-use plastic bags, again, as trash liners, now I need to use that same polypropylene bag 26 times before it comes out ahead in the environmental uh, picture, um, and you can go from there. 
Um, additional considerations. Um, how will you know if the policy worked? I heard Council Member Mavity ask that question too. I think that's a really important um, consideration for you um, as you're passing your policy. Um, consumer behavior is an important and complicated factor. Um, so we know, for instance, that fees and refunds get very different impacts, although it's the net, sort of the, the it's net equal kind of approach. So you might get five cents back for bringing your reusable bag, or you might get charged five cents for a bag. Um, but a fee will have a much more powerful impact on behavior, much more deterrent behavior, um, deterrent effect than a refund will. Um, I already mentioned the issue of, you know, might there be some unintended consequence that you haven't considered? Um, it helps to talk to consumers ahead of time to know how are they using the bags right now? Are they getting recycled regularly? Are they getting used uh, for dog walks? Are they getting used for trash can liners? Um, that should not be maybe minimized. Um, and then you want to think about what happens in the initial impact and then impact over time. Is it likely that people would p perhaps like habituate to a fee, get used to that five cents. Would you need to revisit it over time uh, to get the same impact that you're looking for? So just some additional considerations. Um, so those are really the main points that I wanted to make. Um, I would be happy to answer questions um, after Paul um, does his. Thank you. Thank you. Now it is Paul Croning from uh, Hennepin County. Thank you. Uh, just, just real quickly uh, to kind of give you an idea of where, where Hennepin County stands on, on the issue of plastic bags reuse. Similar to the PCA, uh, the, the county board is not taking a position on this. Staff has not brought a plastic bag ban to the board for consideration. Uh, neither have any of our commissioners asked us to put together a proposal. We've concentrated most of our efforts. Uh, as Mary Ellen mentioned, we're basically uh, bound to comply with the solid waste management policy plan that the PCA develops with county input. Uh, the primary uh, target in that is a 75% recycling goal. So right now, to be honest, we're targeting our efforts at where we can get the most bang for the buck to meet the 75% recycling goal. Uh, plastic bags in uh, a couple different waste sorts we've done uh, is about 6% of the waste stream in Hennepin County. Mm -hmm. So it's a relatively small quantity. Uh, and uh, there's a little bit more, uh, and that's not, that's not just retail bags, that's plastic bags and film. Probably about half of that is, is retail bags, what you call a grocery bag. Uh, there's a little bit more in the commercial, a little bit more bags and film in the commercial, about 7%, a little bit less in the residential, about 5% in the residential waste stream. We, we support, obviously, the county uh, supports both source reduction and recycling. We encourage our residents to, to take the bags to the retailers for recycling. We discourage our residents from putting them in the curbside recycling program. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to uh, visit materials recovery facility, but the plastic bags make a real mess in the materials recovery facilities. Uh, they get wrapped up in equipment. The only hauler I know of in, in the area that, that's chosen to try and take bags uh, uh, in their curbside program uh, is Republic. Uh, and, and basically they, they instruct their residents to put plastic bags in a bag uh, in their recycling bin if you ask Republic whether they wish they did that or not, I, I don't know. But they do make a, a big mess in materials recycling facilities. So we're likely not going to require or encourage that they be added to curbside recycling programs. We think the retail uh, recycling option is a good option, and that's what we encourage our residents to do. Obviously, the best answer is to encourage a reusable bag, period, uh, to use neither uh, a disposable plastic or disposable paper. But as, as you saw from Madeline's presentation, obviously the reusable bags got to get used quite a few times uh, to, to make up the higher environmental impact because there's more material and, and uh, more environmental impact from that bag. We have in the past supported some of the plastic bags recycling. We, we originally uh, provided some money to the uh, uh, Recycling Association of Minnesota and the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce Wastewise Program to help support some of the, the collection costs from the It's in the Bag program. Uh, we, in the last couple of years, we've, uh, they've found additional outlets and been able to reduce their, their uh, cost for that program, so we're no longer providing that subsidy. We are still uh, providing some subsidy for what's called blue, blue wrap recycling, which is primarily for medical facilities. Uh, so we do provide that subsidy uh, as of right now. 
as, as Malin mentioned, that the solid waste policy uh, plan is, is in the process of development right now. So we'll be, along with several other stakeholders, working with the PCA to, to talk about what are our priorities over the next particularly six years uh, and how are we going to meet that 75% recycling goal. So plastic bags, I'm sure, will be part of that discussion. Uh, but I don't envision the county uh, any time in the near future going with, with a ban. We've gone primarily with voluntary uh, incentive-based methods uh, and like I mentioned, really gone at parts of the waste stream where we think we can get the most towards 75% recycling. So with that, I happy to answer questions. Questions from the council? Council Member Sanger. I have a question for either or both of you. Do you have any research data that looks at the question of how many times residents actually reuse um, plastic bags or grocery paper grocery bags, either one. Uh, not how many times would they have to, but in real life, how many times do they really reuse it, if any? <laughs> I haven't seen any studies Minnesota specific or to our metro area specific about reuse behaviors. So it would be great if St. Louis Park wanted to uh, take that on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then maybe I could ask a follow-up sure. question. I have, um, in some of the reading I have done, it has been suggested that, well, just ban the really thin bags, but let businesses still um, give out the thicker um, bags on the theory that those uh, could be reused because they're stronger. Mm -hmm. And the same question, though, just because they could be reused, do we, is there any evidence to say they actually are reused? Well, right. I <laughs> It's, a, it's an excellent question, and like, and that was one of the points that I tried to make, was that consumer behavior is an important part of this, and I think it's important to have an understanding of it. I have not seen, like I said, good studies that are Minnesota metro specific. Um, I think we probably, if I had to guess, I would guess we are higher than a lot of other places in the United States. Um, I can only speak for myself, though. My concern with that, too, would be obviously the thicker bag, you're now using more material, so the environmental impact of that bag is quite a bit higher. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so it needs the bag, to be reused. Material. Yeah, it definitely would have to be reused multiple times to overcome that. Though. And, and the reason I'm asking this is because it's, in my own, I guess, sort of real world experience, it seems about the most that anybody ever reuses a bag is once. I mean, once at the, when they get it at the grocery store or wherever, and then they use it once more either for their trash or because they're walking their dog or something, but that's it. And then it still goes in the landfill. Well, that may be true for the single-use plastic bags, yeah. right? But So I brought my show and tell. Um, so this is sort of that polypropylene reusable bag that I think is probably the most common that you would see as a reusable alternative, right? And these, I suspect, do get used many times. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I wasn't talking about those. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Yep. Councilmember Halton. Thank you. Um, so, Paul, you, you made a comment about Hennepin County and the commissioners haven't asked for this type of study or talked about this and that you follow the, you know, the, the MPCA's guidelines. Is there... Is that just is that just policy that you guys follow those guidelines or and or if you know if a commissioner or commissioners were to come to you you would start the same process that we're kind of doing here uh, yeah I, I would say uh, the policy plan sort of sets the the uh, uh, the parameters within which we work uh, we can be more specific and, and do additional initiatives in addition to the policy plan. So basically we need to do at least what's in the policy plan and then obviously we can do things above and beyond what's in the policy plan. Uh, so if the commissioners did come to us with initiative, uh, we wouldn't say, well, we can't do it because it's in the policy plan. We, that would be something we would do that would be uh, uh, above and beyond uh, what we're required to do in the policy plan. Thank you. Councilmember Ross. Yes. Thank you. I've <laughs> got a couple questions, one for each of you. Is Hennepin County first? You've got a 75% goal on recycling. How far along are we towards the goal? Uh, Councilmember, that's actually a very good question. Right now, we're, uh, if, if you just look at recycling, we're at 41% recycling, and then we're also doing an additional 3% organics recycling. So we're at a combined 44% right now. 
All right. Well, that's that's progress. Right. So <laughs> we got to continue to do that. Uh, second question for you, Hennepin County: <clears throat> Is six percent of the waste stream is plastic bags or or film? You said. Yeah. And how do you measure that? Is that by total weight? It is. It's a uh, uh, solid waste stream. The composition is generally measured by weight. So obviously, you look at the volume of plastic bags, the volume is considerably more than 6%. All right. It's a substantial number, no doubt. Uh, then for the MPCA, are there any types of measurements, how much we have in the way of microplastics in, the, in our waterways? Oh, well, we, we were asked actually by the legislature to do a report on the microplastics, well, specifically the microbeads. Um, and so there's a, there's a good report out there on the microbeads. But I know that microplastics, they used to be thought of as a problem in our marine uh, aquatic environment, but they are definitely being found in the high, quali high quantities in, um, in our lakes, uh, in the Great Lakes specifically. Um, and that would come from um, Rigid, pl rigid plastics and other plastics that break down over time. Um, and uh, I could not even hazard a guess as to how much of that comes from plastic bags versus utensils, bottles, flip-flops, you know, everything else that gets, uh, gets put in there. Um, I would like to take just a moment to add to the 75% goal that there's also a 6% uh, overall reduction goal in that Metropolitan Policy Plan of actually just reducing the amount of waste that's generated by 6%. And then after we do that, we'd like to recycle 75% of the remainder. So. 6% of the waste then and 6% of the reduction goal. Thank you. Mm. Councilmember Ravity. Yes. Uh, just note that the county's increase in organics recycling, as I understand, 46% uh, of that increase is due to St. Louis Park's residents <laughs> who have been uh, working on organics recycling. Is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, that is correct. <laughs> Post Park has definitely helped our numbers. And you're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Thank you. Um, I, you, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Chochi. Chochi. Chochi, thank you. Uh, Ms. Chochi, you had had a chart up talking about, I believe, the carbon footprint or the impacts between plastics and paper. Mm -hmm. And I have two questions along these lines. One is, it seemed that your chart sort of ends where the landfill is. And my understanding is that plastics in general, and certainly plastic bags, that their impacts um, that live on, the paper bags actually do end. They compost, they landfill, they, they sort of end. Where plastic bags, um, when I was looking at the, the ocean plastic gyres, whatever, it, I'm sure you pronounce them better than I do, where, where plastics are just, uh, increasing and increasing in terms of the levels of pollution and don't leave yeah, in ways that we're not seeing. And I just, so I want to, I, I want to talk about that because I wasn't sure that your chart actually goes long enough or, oh. um, <laughs> right, in terms of really looking at what those longer term impacts are. Right. That's and one uh, question, then I have a follow up after okay. that. Okay. So yeah. in part, it doesn't go that far because some of the end of life, uh, some of the end of life impacts just aren't as substantial as those upstream production impacts. So they, they affect the overall sort of footprint in a very small way. Now there are values that you may hold about uh, plastics in the water um, and that's, that's a different issue. Um, I suspect that it's not a lot of plastic bags from St. Louis Park that are ending up in the ocean um, because, <laughs> because we have a pretty good solid waste management system here. Um, in a landfill, nothing decomposes. So plastic is inert, but paper also does not really decompose in a landfill. Food does not really decompose very well in a landfill. Uh, landfills are not meant to be compost sites. So everything kind of stays. That's the point of a landfill. Um, uh, and paper and plastic are both readily recyclable in Minnesota right now. So they're both accepted in recycling streams. Um, so my second question is, and, and this has come up several times, and when we first started talking about that, have heard this from lots of residents who have come up and said, well, what am I going to do when I walk my dog? Like, isn't that sort of the end-all, be-all question? And so... Well... Yeah. I mean. <laughs> and I have a dog. So, uh, but I think it has felt very limited in how we have framed this conversation, and even with your analysis, that it's paper versus plastic. 
And in our organics program, we have um, compostable bags that the city provides to its residents that are compostable. And it seems to me, and I believe it's over a year or something, Scott, you could correct me, but, but, but over time they compost in a lot quicker way than plastics, if I understand correctly. And, and so the question is, aren't there alternatives that we're not even putting on the table right now as we're comparing plastics and paper, all in between that we have created that would function and feel and, uh, and cost out similarly to what plastic is doing right now in terms of the, our need, mm. people's need for plastic bags. Do you want to say anything about sure. that? Because I, I, I can too. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give my response and then I'd be glad. Um, in general, I mean, there are compostable bags. They're made of starches or uh, of various sorts, um, usually corn or soy stock right now. Um, and those typically actually take more resources to produce. Um, and they're much more expensive um, because they take a lot of resources. You need to grow the corn first, for starters. <laughs> and uh, as any farmer will tell you, that's a resource intensive process. And so, um, again, the PCA hasn't taken a stance, but my personal recommendation would be not to support or not to really try and foster a compostable option as the alternative um, because using those resources for another single use product is just not really resource efficient. Um, if you're comparing a, a, a paper bag versus a plastic bag versus a compostable bag, and you're throwing all of them in the waste stream, then, it, then it's a waste of resources uh, and the compostable bag's more expensive. If, if you've got a, a product that you can get in your compostable stream in your organics program in St. Louis Park, for example, uh, then definitely the compostable bag, but correct me if I'm wrong, generally uh, animal feces you discourage from the compost process, so you would not be directing your residents to put that in your right. compost. That's correct, yeah. Thanks for that PSA. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful, thank you. Any other questions from council? Thank you. Thank you. We will move to uh, business organizations and their presentations and Q&A. Uh, and my understanding is uh, we're gonna have first the Twin West Chamber with Deb McMillan. Uh, then we'll have Dan McElroy from the Minnesota Restaurant Association. Then Bruce Newstead with Minnesota Retailers. And finally, Jamie Fool with uh, the Minnesota Grocery Association. Wherever you wanna be, Deb. Good evening. Uh, everyone can hear me. I'm Deb McMillan. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Twin West Chamber of Commerce, which is a business organization that represents more than 700 businesses and 55,000 employees in the western suburbs, including St. Louis Park. We want to thank you first and foremost for inviting us this evening to take part in the conversation as you consider these policy options. I know it's a, it's a heavy lift and it's a big deal. So we appreciate the, the involvement. Um, the City of St. Louis Park has been a leader in adopting policies and programs to encourage and incentivize recycling. This is evidenced by the robust programs and a website to educate, encourage, and support sustainability efforts without punitive bans. To that end, we encourage you to consider carefully what you would like to accomplish and devise a system to ensure that you are meeting those goals in a way that can, that can be measured and that won't negatively impact business development and business retention here in St. Louis Park. It will come as no surprise that the business community has concerns about adopting a policy that bans certain products or creates mandates for businesses and residents that are onerous, administratively burdensome, and not required of their competitors in neighboring communities. The increased cost to businesses to comply ultimately get passed on to consumers through their higher prices, making it difficult to compete with businesses in neighboring cities that don't have the same fixed costs. I know we looked at uh, Corvallis, Oregon, which is a freestanding community and 90 miles from Portland. St. Louis Park is an inner ring suburb and has the distinction of being comfortably close to everything and easy, easily accessible. <laughs> you are welcome. Yeah, nice marketing, right? <laughs> That same proximity allows consumers to easily shop outside of St. Louis Park. 
implementing policy that is originally considered progressive can actually end up being regressive as consumers and businesses seek alternatives right over city borders. We favor efforts to continue to encourage recycling efforts and reduction efforts through the utilization of programs already in place like Minnesota WasteWise, Hennepin County's business recycling grants. Twin West believes an approach to reducing plastics and polystyrene that is incentive-based, includes the stakeholders in the process, and takes business and consumer interests into consideration. We believe that works best. Thanks for your time. Again, happy to answer questions. We'll save the questions for the business groups till the end. Okay. Right. You're up. Thank you. Dan McElroy from the Minnesota Restaurant Association. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to share some ideas. I will do my very best to be brief. Um, one, I heard the issue of litter mentioned, mm -hmm. and no one cares more about litter than my members because their brand is on the litter. And it is negative advertising to have whatever your brand is on a bag that you find on that fence post or in that tree or in the ditch. And so we spend, my members spend, hundreds of thousands of dollars on trash containers and picking up trash in parking lots and branding bags, please recycle me or treat me responsibly. And so we're on the same side on litter, and we continue to work hard to do that. Um, I thank Council Member Spano for asking the question about exempting um, restaurants. I provided a list to staff, but there are more than 100 cities in the U.S. that have bans like you're considering, and for, with a variety of exemptions. About three-fourths of them exempt uh, restaurants. And the reason is, as um, the, the gentleman from Corvallis said, um, we have things that are messy, wet, hot, and don't do well on car seats or upholstery. And uh, they, whether it's Szechuan sauce or barbecue sauce or um, the two-liter uh, Pepsi that is sweating most of the time and will often go in the bag, they just don't do very well most of the time in paper bags. Now, there are some exceptions to that. We certainly have members who put sandwiches or other things in paper bags. Jimmy John's brand is paper bags. Um, some of my members have both paper and plastic. McDonald's puts sandwiches in paper, salads in plastic. They put it where their customers have told them they want it. One of my members offers both. Devani's always asks, would you like paper or plastic? 93% of their customers choose plastic. Now, it isn't just about customer preference. It's often about that spill, soak, drop, hot, wet problem. So as you think about this, I'd urge you to keep that um, in mind. There is also a new law coming I want to be sure you know about, and that is a requirement that effective on January 1, 2016, businesses in the seven-county metro area that generate four cubic yards of mixed municipal waste, trash, per week have to recycle three or more types of materials. And our members are looking for ways to meet that. And some things are easy. Corrugated is easy. Aluminum and steel cans, glass and plastic are relatively easy. So we already have an incentive to separate that both in the kitchen stream and the dining room stream. And so some of the kinds of things that lead both to the quantity of the waste stream and to litter, we hope will be helped with that emerging uh, metro-wide ban. Now, interestingly, the legislation is silent on whether that's compacted or uncompacted volume. And so one thing that may happen is more compacted collection to go below the four cubic yards, but cost-wise, it's a good deal to recycle, particularly corrugated and glass, because they have some value. So we uh, hope that you will um, I, I applaud the public process and the opportunity for input. We look forward to being involved. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Now, uh, Bruce Newstead from the Minnesota Retailers Association. Uh, council members, thank you very much for the time to be here tonight. My name is Bruce Newstead, as uh, Beloy said, with the Minnesota Retailers Association. As the name suggests, I represent retailers across the state, including some in St. Louis Park here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I just wanted to share just a little bit of information on kind of consumer behavior, St. Louis Park consumer behavior, and St. Louis Park uh, retailer behavior too, so you can kind of factor that into how you look in at approaching uh, the issue of plastic bags in your community. Uh, but first off, I do want to applaud uh, the conversation surrounding this. Uh, from a retailer's perspective, uh, we're always thinking about how to help consumers with their behaviors. Now, usually that's because we want them to buy something, right? Uh, but it does lead to a lot of research into how to motivate consumers, and generally retailers have found that a consumer is best motivated with an incentive 
as opposed to something punitive. So if you go, you'll see sales and discounts and reasons to come to the store as opposed to punishment. So we would give you that uh, <laughs> little bit of thought from the perspective of how you approach this particular uh, issue in St. Louis Park. Um, I know you heard a little bit about St. Louis Park not being an island. You're certainly comfortably close. That was very nice, Deb, uh, to a lot of different things. So I won't belabor that. But I do want to give you just a little information on some of the things we see from retailers in St. Louis Park today relative to how they work with consumers and specific to plastic bags. Um, gone are the days uh, where a consumer would be automatically have their items put in a plastic bag at a St. Louis Park retailer or even a paper bag. It's fairly common for a retailer now to ask not just would you like paper or plastic, because that was 10 years ago. Now the first question is, would you like a bag with that? So I think you'll see uh, among the community that retailers are generally doing a good job, number one, of just not assuming that a bag is part of the transaction. So uh, we applaud them for that. Um, second, many retailers uh, provide receptacles for bag recycling. I think we heard from the PCA in Hennepin County uh, that that's an efficient way of actually recycling bags. So it's not too uncommon for you to go to a a retailer in St. Louis Park and find the opportunity to actually recycle a bag. Having said that, I am probably like most of you, I reuse my bags at home. My, my uh, point of sale bags go in my bathroom trash can as an example, or for my dog walk, or for my kids' uh, cleats after soccer practice, etc. So that's great though because that means we're actually done a, the first step in changing consumer behavior. We've had consumers figure out, you know what, I don't just take that bag and throw it out right away. There are other uses for that. So that's a great first step and we'd encourage the council to look at what's the next step in that process. And then finally, I mentioned uh, in the area of incentives, uh, there's actually a retailer and several here in St. Louis Park that actually provide a financial incentive for consumers not to elect uh, a bag. So if you go to the Once Upon a Child franchise here in St. Louis Park and you see Judy, which great business model, by the way, they're already taking your stuff council member and reselling it, so good for them from an environmental perspective. Uh, but if you elect not to have a bag, they'll give you a double punch on your punch card there. So I think there's some great opportunities uh, to look at consumer behavior and some of the things that are occurring in the marketplace uh, that might be working. And if there's ways to incent that type of behavior among others, uh, I think there's some great opportunities there. So I just wanna conclude uh, by just wrapping up a couple ideas that I heard. There are some things that we really love. Uh, we love when nonprofits get engaged in this. And you heard a story uh, today of how nonprofits will help produce a bag to further the, the goal of using reusable bags, et cetera. There's just a lot of great opportunity in this marketplace uh, for those types of collaborations. Uh, so I wanna end just by saying, uh, we look forward to the conversation. We'd prefer to talk about the great ways to incent people rather than should, if you put hamburger in a bag, should that bag be exempt? Should Dan's restaurant bags be exempt? You know, the laundry list, should pharmacy bags be exempt? Should hospital bags be exempt? Uh, should certain brands of retailers be exempt? We'd prefer to talk about the positive aspects of really encouraging community uh, engagement in this as opposed to the punitive approach. But again, thank you so much for the time today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bruce. Now it's Jamie Poole from the Minnesota Grocers Association. Good evening, council members. I'm Jamie Poole, as you heard, and I'm president of the Minnesota Grocers Association. So we are a trade association that represents the food industry. We've been around for over 117 years. We have 200 retail members with 1,100 st stores statewide. Our member companies employ about 125,000 union and non-union members all across the state. Um, on behalf of the food industry of Minnesota, we greatly appreciate St. Louis Park's collaborative approach on the bag recycling efforts under consideration. When dealing with these types of policies, as you've, as you've heard from everyone, we also believe it's important to ask, what is the defined concern? What are the desired results? and what role can all stakeholders play in the solutions. We do caution in creating a policy that has the potential to make winners and losers in the marketplace, um, limit consumer choice, and turn um, some unintended consequences into businesses in St. Louis Park and consumers here. Um, as active members of our local communities, um, we are forefront in supporting sustainable environmental issues. The Minnesota Grocers Association is a leader in voluntary recycling and are committed to aggressive waste reduction. For over a decade, we have voluntarily encouraged our shoppers to reduce, reuse, and recycle by offering plastic recycling at our locations. Um, we are in the forefront of this. You heard about the WasteWise program, and that was a collaborative, uh, inv an inventive idea with our, our groups and our grocers. Um, one of the interesting things in talking with our grocers, you've got three large ones within St. Louis Park today. Um, we had a long conversation, and they were sharing with me that they believe two to one bags coming in versus bags going out, right? Because they don't simply 
take their own bags back in those recycle bins, right? You're taking the toilet paper wrappers that you have, you're taking the bag bags, you're taking all your newspaper bags, your dry cleaner bags, and you're putting all of those in the grocer's bins. Now the WasteWise program isn't necessarily still up and running, so those are actually sent back to manufacturers through our locations, and those are then again recycled back and reused in a multitude of ways for decking, for chairs, for all kinds of things, even on siding now is, is where we're finding that reused. But so think about that, that it isn't necessarily bag out, bag in. We're actually doing a great service for our communities by taking all of that back. And as you heard, this is not a curbside option. So I also hasten to think what may happen if we were to ban the plastic bags in looking at maintaining maintaining some of those voluntary programs as unintended consequences. Um, we also, we talked a lot tonight already about voluntary programs and I was so proud to see one of our bags come back through. We've partnered um, for, it's been a while, but I guess to show again how progressive Minnesota was, this is back in 2008, we partnered with Pollution Control, again looking for some of those unique partnerships. We had a plethora of bags. We have stickers that we put in the car windows in, in, in our store to say remember to reuse. Um, we had an incentive program where you were on your honor and if you voluntarily reused six times you were entered in a drawing to get a gift card at your local grocer and I think some of these ways are great ideas and, and again these are you know concepts and things to float around but looking for ways to encourage and incentivize that behavior and again in looking at the pollution controls conversation about all the variety of bags, I think there's pros and cons to every single one of them you could possibly talk about. So what are we looking to resolve and how are we looking to get there? Um, again, we do know that in a community like St. Louis Park, we have seen it in other places, people will drive and will make change if they feel they're being put upon and forced to make some choices they don't want to make. Um, our customers and your customers are our first and foremost priority and them being able to have that choice as they go through that checkout line is really critical. Again, the, one of the last things I'll say before closing is the patchwork is a great concern for us because we do have a multitude of members that work in multiple cities and having one ban or fee or a restriction over here, having something else over there creates a, a complicated patchwork that again is very, very difficult for us to execute. And again, it gets confusing for consumers. When you think about who your St. Louis Park um, customer, who your St. Louis Park um, constituent is, they're probably driving from another city coming in, so they may pass a multitude of retail outlets on their way in and making those choices. We certainly don't want to create a competitive disadvantage. Um, so with that, what I, I hope that we can work together. We love being a part, and, and again, with our work with the pollution control and with WasteWise, we love being a part of these innovative and creative solutions. We see the customers 1.5 times a week in our stores, and we are happy to look for ways to, um, to incentivize. We're proud to be a part of that com community, and we think comprehensive, innovative solutions that leverage investments and in things that are already there are the way to make environmentally friendly choices. So we thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of the conversation. We look forward to its ongoing work and um, we'll be happy to stand for questions as well. Questions how'd we, how'd we do? Did we make our time? You're doing great. <laughs> Pretty good to get four of us off here. You're doing great. <laughs> Any questions from council for business organizations? Council Member Sanger. I think, th I think this question goes primarily to the Twin West Chamber and to the um, res the uh, Grocery uh, Association. Um, would your members be willing to give away the strong, whether they're cloth bags or, I'm sorry, the, the thick plastic, re clearly reusable bags, um, would you would you be willing to give that away or have some financial incentive for your customers to be able to um, acquire them so they can continually reuse those bags? We have not surveyed our members to find out if they'd be willing to do something like that. Um, we've always found them to be very cooperative with things like that, however. Um, but at this point in time, I couldn't say, you know, would they be willing to do that or not? I think, I think all options are open, absolutely. Okay. 
And I would say that I certainly know, and, and one of the grocers actually that is in St. Louis Park currently incentivizes the use of those reusable bags. And um, in, in talking with our partners there, I don't know that they would be necessarily giving them away, but I certainly know through the course of promotions or other things, I think there's always opportunity for ways to, to look at, I mean, again, innovative ideas. We did a giveaway um, through the Grocers Association for a period of time. So again, I can't speak 100%. I haven't asked them that either as an alternative, but you know, we're always open to conversation. I, fine, and I'm just, I would encourage that conversation to happen. I, I think it's a little um, unfair, frankly, to just hope that nonprofits will step up when they have far fewer resources to do that. So I would hope that the um, stores themselves would consider some kind of program along those lines. Councilmember Mavity. Yep, uh, two questions. Uh, the same question I had earlier, you, if you would please. Uh, you were talking about the initiatives that your uh, members have taken, mm -hmm. which I applaud. And again, it sounds like early adapters on some of this as well. Do you have any metrics on that in terms of what the impact has been on those voluntary initiatives in reducing use, whether it's by store or you know, by chain or whatever that is? You know, I, we've gone back and done some polling, and I do have some of most of our numbers are older. Um, but we do know when we run an incentive program, we'll see a lift or a shift in behavior. Maintaining that shift, quite frankly, I think in all of us would be possibly a little bit guilty of that. Sometimes it's difficult to get consumers to remember and to reuse and to do those things. But I will tell you that we have seen nothing but growth in the um, recycling program. Um, our, our grocers are emptying those large bins anywhere from 15 to 20 times a day. So we do see that continue to expand. So that definitely is a change in the waste stream behavior. But at checkout, I think some of those are still a little challenging to have all those metrics. Sure. And then my second question, maybe a follow-up to that, and I can't find it in this moment in our report, although I know it's in here somewhere. Uh, it mentioned that the pricing for recycling of these bags is zero, right? There's somewhere in the report that, that literally, you know, in terms of having a market for recycling these bags, uh, I believe somewhere, and I'll find the quote, is zero. So my question is, how much is it costing you all, and have you tracked what happens at when those bins are getting recycled in terms of what percent is actually ending up in the recycling stream yeah, getting into those end products for which it was intended? Because I know we've had some challenges uh, at different times with uh, multifamily and commercial um, entities that have tried to recycle, but in the end it gets merged into a single stream because there's no market. At the at the end for it, and you're speaking specifically of plastic bags, yes, and the market for them after single yeah, use. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, just like you would purchase aluminum, and it's so many cents on the doll, you know, on the pound or whatever that is. That I, I, my understanding, and again, I'll find it if anyone can quote me on the page in the report where it says it's zero. <laughs> Well, and recycle I, for bags. So I my can, sense is, G I can jump in there real quick just to make a clarification. Oh, yes, that um, that statement is in regard to polystyrene, uh, rigid polystyrene plastic, that was provided by Hennepin County. Uh, that plastic is mixed in with three through seven plastics at Murphs and sold. And right now, that plastic uh, commodity is at zero. And are p plastic bags a part of that or not? No. Oh. Okay, no. so so then I guess the question, the first question would be, what is the market for this, and and is it does it really have a marketable end product, and if not, who's really following that through? Because otherwise, it would seem that it's costing the industry money to recycle. So you're already spending money to get it into whatever end product. Well, I can. I, I looks like you've got <laughs> some answers as well. I can only give you kind of a little bit, and I can do some more research mm -hmm. all the way back through. I, I, I would venture to guess that we're making an assumption that people are doing what they say they're doing all the way through once it goes back to these. I know when we were working with Merrick and some of those programs, we do know they were going into, I mean, they are making benches and decks, and there is this particular product is um, 
definitely has a market. I don't know what the going rate is of that. Um, but what I also do know is that e even from the retailer side, there certainly is an expense to run a voluntary recycling program in labor and in you have to store these bags in the back room. You do have to sort through and through them. And well, I'm not here to be anti-recycling at the front end, but there is certainly some cost that goes into this just from, from ours. And then honestly, they're being you know shipped back and they ship back and to get to their end life so there is some some expense here to run the voluntary program and again i can certainly get back to you and find out more about the end and mm -hmm. and yeah. cost what the rate is on those for well, sure. well the cost and just um you know how much actually ends up there yeah in the end versus gets well i think but maybe bruce jamie i think you did say though that your retailers who are taking plastic bags are taking more in yes to recycle than they're putting out. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, but that's a separate question. I'm just yeah. asking about where the end product is actually ending up. Yep. Got, got it. Bruce, remember, I think you have to generate a fair amount of plastic bag recycling to be paid for somebody to pick up that commodity. So right. I do think it's common for retailers to make that investment as part of their voluntary program. But I couldn't tell you exactly how much. I know the market varies a little bit, and those are all contractually based. But uh, there's a market there, but I it's, it would be a false assumption that every retailer make something for recycling those the market yeah. mm -hmm. other questions from the council yes Councilmember Bross. Uh, as far as p paper bags go what's kind of the price point that the grocers or retailers would have to recover to make it you know revenue neutral basically if you're if you're banned from giving out any type of plastic bags and they're a cheaper easier product for you to give out mm -hmm. uh, how much more is it going to cost you to offer paper because ideally we'd like to design the incentive for the consumer to be right about what your cost is i mean right. we don't want to penalize the retailers and you know you're looking at anywhere i mean the, the five cents to six cents difference between the two bags and i and i will also tell you just something to be proud of in st louis park if if the the direction is to looking to ban or to reduce the plastic use in the conversations that i had some of our larger um, corporate partners looking at their statewide numbers and where the bags are going the numbers here in st louis park were astronomically lower for your plastic bag use here than compared to some of their other places. So, so whatever you guys are already doing for education, you're doing a nice job. So, but, but yeah, I think the, you know, the nickel is about the difference between the two. Come with someone in And then a follow-up question is on a national level, isn't it true that a lot of communities have in fact instituted plastic bag bans? Have the retailers there seen significant loss of dollars in their margins I mean isn't it the larger retailers at least the the big national corporations are going to be able to adapt to this type of proposal again I think in looking at the research and looking at what goes on to some of the comparables across the nation it also depends on what's going on in those in the communities around them. We do know that people have changed their behaviors depending on what their options are to move even for that nickel, though it seems maybe insignificant. It is significant to some. Um, I don't know that there's a large influx if that's the mandate. I mean, the business is going to determine how best to do that, whether it's increasing a cost here. Or, you know, I mean, it will get managed. Um, I don't know if that answers, Tim, your, council member, your question. Council member Bross. And one last follow-up to that, since uh, the city just to the east of us, that really large entity known as <laughs> the Minneapolis, one? Yeah. is, <laughs> is considering a similar type band in the future, wouldn't there be an economy of scale then if more communities adopt that, rather than once again creating the patchwork with the largest city in the metropolitan area having one set of regulations and the rest of us not following along? I would certainly say that I'm not here to advocate for a <laughs> statewide de decision on this, but certainly a statewide resolution is much easier to manage. As, as you've seen, that, that is why California went the route that they've gone, is that in looking at, you know, they had over 100 different jurisdictions, and each jurisdiction had a very different twist to it, and it became very, very complicated to manage all of that. So, so I would I would certainly say that you know a, a larger conversation is easier than city by city when you're looking at again tight cities especially that consumers can have choice. Mm -hmm. 
Councilmember Spana. Thanks. I just I've got a couple of. I mean, maybe some of them are questions and some of them are observations. Um, so, Deb, one of the things that you mentioned was waste-wise, and, and actually I'm very familiar with the St. Paul Hotel, and they won the 2014 award uh, for some of their work uh, through the waste-wise program. But, but I was just looking at it because I was trying to remember an instance where this issue was ever addressed by waste-wise, and I don't see anything here. And you mentioned... Programs like WasteWise uh, and using programs like WasteWise to try and help with this. So I'm just wondering if you can tell me what exactly you, your thought process is on that. I've got a, a follow up as well. Yeah, I, I think um, WasteWise does a bunch of different things. I mean, they ha they they will do energy audits, they do waste stream audits, they do um, composting and and some of those kinds of things. So they'll they'll come out to your business or a business and and do a complete audit on it for. It depends on, um, I know they have a number of different ways to, to manage the cost of that. I'm not sure all the details behind that. But they have a number of different programs. So not only um, will they do composting and that sort of thing, but they also do energy audits and waste stream audits and the whole thing. But on this specific issue, the use of <coughs> I have plastic, I'm just trying to. I have not seen a specific, uh, specific to plastic bags, I have not seen a program on that. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. With the microphone. Why don't you step there you up go. here? That's okay. There you go. I j just a point of clarification that it's in the bag program. Used to be a program of WasteWise, and it's now moved to the Recycling Association of Minnesota. So that program now operates through that organization. Okay. No wonder I'm not seeing it there. <laughs> um, then I think the you know the other um, uh, point that I. I wanted to pick up on Dan was something that you said, and that is is that Devani's offers to the pizza place. Devani's offers to their customer a choice, and I think if I got this wrote this down right, you said ninety three percent of the people choose paper. Plastic. He said plastic. Choose plastic. Oh, I believe you said paper. No, okay, he said plastic. plastic. You didn't. Okay, plastic. great. All right. So I just wanted to make sure that I that I heard that right. Okay. That answers that thanks Bruce uh, just a quick note on WasteWise uh, WasteWise does have a nice history of recycling plastic bags and I think the statistic is that in the time when they were doing it they recycled about 5.5 million pounds of plastic bags from the Twin Cities Metro alone so there is some good there's a good model there to look at anyway relative to the impact and, and reduction of uh, waste stream and litter. And I just wanted to mention, Blaise, if you don't mind, uh, there are a couple questions that really related back to business models. And it is kind of interesting. There are a lot of different business models in retail. As you can imagine, a, a paper bag at a large national retailer would come at a significantly different cost price point than a retailer in here in St. Louis Park that might be using 100 or 300 uh, paper bags. So it's it's difficult to determine what's that right number uh, because there are so many different models out there. Let me just add one thing too, just because of the diversity of your business groups that you represent. We've talked about single-use plastic and we've talked about a lot of different mills of plastic and et cetera, et cetera. Is there a sense either from council, from staff, or from your folks of just how many different single-use types because I think that the wispy ones we see in trees are the ones that we kind of get pictures of, but I think of retailers or restaurants um, that have different ones, and even retailers that offer a higher grade plastic bag um, from the grocery business. So is there, is there any sense of how you define single use? <laughs> That's to them, right? Good question. To anyone, I mean, I mean, I, I actually think it's one of those questions that, you know, as you guys go through your process and you, you're trying to figure out what's regulated and what's not, um, is, there, is there models from other cities or, um, especially when we talked about exempting certain businesses, et cetera? Bruce? Uh, Boyce, I can't really answer that, but I will say, uh, since the city started this conversation a month or so ago with us, every time I go to a retailer and I receive a plastic bag, when I'm done with it, I turn it over and I look at the bottom. And do that for the next couple of weeks because you'll get a sense for how much post-consumer went into that. You'll get a sense for the recycling label on the back. And it actually kind of opens your eyes really to what the landscape is out there. It's, it's definitely an exercise worth doing. Yep. Yes. Councilmember Spano. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. 
because I have. And I'm just going to, I'm going to name a name. I shop at Cub frequently. And on the bottoms of their plastic bags, it says that, it's made, that it is 100% recyclable. But it doesn't say anything on either side that I've noticed, at least in the last couple times I've checked, about being made from recyclable materials, number one. Number two, on their plastic bags, they're emblazoned with the recycling logo, but they're not actually recycled, made from recycled material at all. It says at the bottom, please, uh, I believe it says, what did I write down? I actually snapped a picture of it. It says something like, please take this to your nearest sorting facility, right? So I just want to be clear about that fact, and I'm not picking on them. It could be anybody. And I'm sure it's many more than just Cub. But, my, but I think part of the reason you're seeing this group up here interested in talking about this is because we're questioning how much the incentive or the good sort of um, the good vibe of thinking that everyone's going to do the right thing. Is it actually doing the right thing? That's that's I think why we're up here. So I'm glad you, you I'm glad you brought it up, Bruce. And again, this was not specific to Cub uh, or Super Value. Um, it could be Target. It could be anybody. Uh, but I just happened to be shopping there, so I checked. Comes my saying. I think that your question really is one that not only can we not precisely answer it today, but it's one that we will have to answer in terms of if we are to craft an ordinance, we will have to define exactly what we mean about what is prohibited and what is not prohibited. But then more impo equally importantly, we have to consider how will the public know? Mm -hmm. One of the things right. that concerns me with this is we could do the best job of defining this kind of bag is acceptable, but this is not. But from the point of view of the public who is not technically trained in how to evaluate these bags, it may not make any difference. So I think we have to have a, if we do a ban at all, it has to be one that is intuitively obvious to the public. Any other questions from council? All right. Thanks. Now I'd like to introduce <coughs> Susan Hubbard. She founded and currently leads her own consulting agency called Nothing Left to Waste, working with organizations to develop and implement their zero waste programs. She's a founder and past CEO of one of the country's leading zero waste organizations, Eureka Recycling. Susan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Maybe I'm a little bit too close. Um, I, um, wanted, I'm representing Eureka Recycling tonight, and I am a founder. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, and Eureka was happy to be asked to be here. We're glad to speak um, to the issues around um, getting to zero waste, and that's the perspective that we have tonight. Um, our view is how do we get to zero waste entirely? And so for that reason, we believe that um, a plastic bag uh, ban with a, a fee on paper bags is a great move. We've looked at it across the country, we've looked at it across the globe, and we've seen tremendous results from it. We think that if you look at bans in Minnesota, you can see that bans have worked, not plastic bag bans, but bans in general. And so from that perspective tonight, that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I think that's why I was asked to come because I'm speaking from that position. Um, Plastic bags, you know, the, I think one of the things that we all agree to hear all the stakeholders is that it's really about the people that live in St. Louis Park and why do they want to do it. Because the reason behind it and the motivation behind it is really the most important thing to get clear so then you can design for what you're trying to do. Um, from our perspective, uh, plastic bags consume a great amount of non-renewable resources. Um, we're not in the... Um, which is better, this disposable item or that disposable item. But in the case of um, plastic and paper, the reason that we err on the side of um, paper bags when people need them or putting a fee on a paper bag to make sure that they know they're still not fabulous, this disposable bags are not good all the way around. But the paper bag actually will compost, it will not remain in the environment, and it is made from, it can be a renewable resource depending on how those trees are harvested and planted. So those are the two major reasons why we look at um, paper bags as not, not getting a ban and plastic bags getting a ban. I think one of the key critical things that I wanna 
bring forward tonight is that there's a grand experiment going on with plastic in the environment right now. And I don't think that I'll be alive long enough to actually see the results, but I think that the children, the grandchildren, and then the great-grandchildren are going to start experiencing those results, and I feel tremendous responsibility, and that's why I've spent my career in an environmental organization. But it's why I feel strongly about um, acting on disposable plastics. I think plastics can be an amazing thing. It can save lives. There's reasons to use plastics, and especially medical applications. But single-time, single-use plastic is just really bad for the environment, and it's obviously using uh, a non-renewable resource if you care about climate change. So if you care about the health of your community and the generations to come, or if you care about climate change, those are two really good reasons to look at banning plastic bags and putting a fee on paper bags, and most importantly, encouraging people to use reusable bags. Those three things have to go tandem together to really be effective because the solution is in the reusable bag. Um, yes, of course, you have to use the reusable bag and the life cycle that was shown. Um, some of the problems with life cycles when you look at them is that particular life cycle did not look at extraction. So the one that Madeline was referring to in that MPCA, um, I was looking at the life cycle comparisons of paper and plastic bags and some of the things that happen are, and especially depending on who's funding the life cycle, is where they're drawing a circle. So if you're not looking at the extraction issue and you're just comparing paper and plastic, you're going to get a lot of different and strange results. Life cycle analysis is, are hard to get your head wrapped around, and you have to really look at all of the information in the source. They're hard to, they're hard to understand. Um, and that's why I think if you're clear about what your motivation is, you can go and look at a life cycle analysis and understand what it's measuring and understand, does that analysis have any relevance to what you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to protect the uh, environment from microscopic plastics that pass through sewage treatment plants? They are, it is um, able to get into the sewage treatment plant and it can pass through a sewage treatment plant. So microscopic plastics are in the water. And it's not just the plastic beads are, that are in the Great Lakes. Um, from the statistics, and I created a, a paper for you all. I'm sh sorry I couldn't spend more time on it, but I did cite the references for it in here because I think it's important that you can look them up yourself. But the um, the size of the problem in the Great Lakes, they are, they're saying right now from the look at it, of it, it's like there's 86 times more plastics than they're seeing in the Pacific. It's like, can that be true? I looked at that so many times. I have to go back and look at it again. And like I said, I didn't have time to really look at it. But it's alarming what's happening in the Great Lakes. And um, this is Minnesota. And one of the beauties about Minnesota is our water. So if you care about plastics in the water, Another good reason to look at saying, hey, that's enough of the disposable single-use plastic bag. Um, there's a lot of other things that I can tell you about. The reusable bags, there's a lot of talk and claims that reusable bags can make you sick. And all of those studies have been refuted by uh, health officials in the cities that were targeted. So if that conversation comes up, I think it's important to recognize that it's, it's, it's not a really a realistic claim. I think the claim that reusable bags are only good if you reuse them, and if you start getting like 50, 60, 70 reusable bags, you've got to start wondering if you're really working it, you know? I mean, is that really <laughs> what you were trying to do in the first place? And so I think giving away more reusable bags, it's like let's think about what we're saying to people when we give them these reusable bags and promote programs. Let's think about r what we're saying to them is take the reusable bag if you really don't have one, but if you have one, please wash it and use it again because that's where the real environmental benefit is. And so it's really about getting into the educational aspect of it, and that's where people in the community, and I know St. Louis Park because we worked here for years, and the people in St. Louis Park care about the environment. And if they get the information and they really understand the motivation behind what's going on, they'll click in and they'll do what's right and what's responsible, in my experience. Um, Endangering the wildlife in Minnesota, I mean, of course, a plastic bag can endanger a turtle in Minnesota just like it can endanger a turtle anywhere. Um, so plastic bags look interesting to wildlife. Um, there's all kinds of reports that they've done in Texas now about the impacts on cattle.
I mean, I suppose if Minnesota wanted to spend a bunch of money, we could figure out what particular animal we wanted to look at and see you know, how much they're exposed to a plastic bag. But the point is basically that a common sense, anybody in a grocery store, anybody that owns a grocery store or owns a restaurant does not want an animal to suffer and die. Basically, they starve to death. Um, either wrapped up in it or they've swallowed it so they can't eat and they starve to death. And there's nobody I've ever met that wants that to happen. It's just like a ridiculous conversation to even get into. Does it hurt wildlife? Yes, it hurts wildlife. Plastic in the environment hurts wildlife. Um, and I think recyclability, I have a little bit of experience there. I've been in recycling <laughs> a lot and um, I've been uh, ran a very big facility and um, plastic bags I can guarantee you are increasing the cost of uh, curbside recycling um, and th there's just a big article in the paper and waste management was whining about costs and so they can go and increase prices to the communities they serve so watch out but um, <laughs> I think that um, What's important about what they're saying is that, that what's the mix of the material, that how many plastic bags are ending up in recycling centers, and I can say that's true for us. And when that happens, let me explain to you what happens is you have a facility and there's 50 people in there and those bags get stuck on the lines and it jams the equipment and you have to shut everything down and all the people are still getting paid and you have to get those bags off that equipment, which is a dangerous job in itself. And then those bags are completely trashed I mean they're filthy and the markets which I do know about the markets for plastic bags are very particular film has to be very 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 clean and so that's why they have problems with receipts they have problems with all kinds of things and we get calls all the time from RAM asking for help to try to market these plastics because you know the markets come and go and it can be a real problem I mean recycling markets do come and go and that's that's part of the the issue of building dependable, reliable markets for materials. This is not just plastic bags, it's all materials. But plastic bag film is very susceptible to contaminants. And once it's dirty or it's got some contaminants in it, it's a big problem. And these grocery stores that have really taken a special effort and I think should be commended for taking back these bags that they're putting out, I don't think in two to one ratio because I don't think that they could possibly take in twice as many bags. The numbers that we have are um, 330 per person, and there's 35,000 people in, uh, or 38,000 people in St. Louis Park. So 330 um, bags per person per year, and that's a lot of plastic bags to be taking back at your grocery stores. Um, but just taking them back and the cost of handling them and then ending up trying to find some place to take them and then when you finally get them there, th them saying they had to be disposed or they were sent further to China or somewhere that we could, could take a less valuable or less clean material. So there's a lot of education that needs to happen around plastics recycling. Um, I, and I also wanted to say about the current recycling rate for plastic bags according to the EPA is like 5% and the current recycling rate for paper bags according to the EPA is 50%. That's according to the EPA so I don't know, um, you know what is absolutely true about all of that. Um, I do know that um, the city of San Jose who owns their own MRF um, spent about a million dollars one year on jams in their MRF, and that was when they enacted a plastic bag ban. So we're talking about a serious problem with plastic bags and MRFs, and, and that education is something that really needs to be undertaken. Um, about positive outcomes, I've got a list of cities and the positive outcomes that have, have gone into effect. But one of the things to be aware of is if you don't put a fee on the paper bag, you're going to drive people to the paper bag. And I don't think that that's the intention. So when I say plastic is bad, I'm not saying paper is good. And paper has a whole list of environmental problems associated with it also. It's just that it does decompose. And so there, there isn't the threat of the plastics and the toxins that build up in the bodies, uh, the body burden. So it's still important to group those two things together and to make sure that we're not trying sending the wrong signal to people. Um, I don't know, I just, in, in closing, I guess, um, if you don't reuse a reusable bag, is not much better than any other bag. So a focus on education is paramount. Plastic, 
um, over paper for me because I think the legacy to the children and the grandchildren, I just don't want my name on the vote that said, I wasn't worried about plastics in the environment. I wasn't worried about microscopic plastic in our wadi, water and in our bodies. I, I just, I don't feel good about that experiment. I got a gut feeling that that's not going to go well. Um, and I think that the impact to the environment and to wildlife, it's just too much to bear, really. I mean, all the pictures, and I could have come in with a PowerPoint and done the whole bird laying there with the plastic in its gut and the, the turtles that are all wrapped up in plastic bags or whatever. But realistically, I mean, I just feel like that points a bad finger at the stores that point out plastic bags, and I know those people don't want that to happen. And I don't think that that's the debate we're in. So I'm going to close there and then answer, try to answer any questions that you have. Council members. Council member Mavity. One of the earlier com uh, commenters was talking about when I asked the question about the impact on uh, do we have choices beyond plastic and paper. We've talked about reuse. And now you've sort of introduced this idea of this life cycle analysis, sort of going from the source and extraction all the way to whatever that end product is. So can you comment on uh, this issue about compostable bags? Because it sounds like their use of water and other kinds of natural resources to grow the corn, to create the starch, to build the bag, uh, also has a big impact. Can you talk a little about what mm -hmm. the range of options are in that one in particular or others that you're aware of? Absolutely. Um, a compostable bag is still a single-use bag. Um, and to put it ahead of plastic, I absolutely would, as long as it was actually compostable and not biodegradable. But to, to, for the reasons that you're trying to do what you're going to do, I think you need to think about that because it's still sending the message that it's disposable. It, 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 while it isn't going to persist in the environment, there is an environmental impact of bag after bag after bag being used. And there are resources that have to be extracted to make um, compostable bags. Um, but hands down over a, a plastic bag that doesn't um, compost, that decomposes into microscopic pieces that end up in our body and our children's bodies, hands down I'm for that. Other questions from council members? Uh, Susan, I'd just like you to make clear the, the extraction cost. You're talking about actually being out there and mining the oil that's going to be used for the plastic bags, correct? Yeah, uh, it's 12 million barrels of uh, oil are needed to make 100 billion plastic bags that Americans use annually. Um, and we use them around roughly 20, 12 minutes. So it's 12 million barrels of oil a year, and we use the bag for 12 minutes. So 12 is a magical number. Now, if we put it in the liner of our trash can, we probably use it longer, but we still only use it twice. So recycling it over putting it as a liner, definitely, and then recycling it in a way that's clean and not contaminated, that's hard to do, but education is important. Um, the, the fraction of the amount of oil that we use to, to make plastics is small, but the important thing about it is that all of the, single, all of the plastic that we use for packaging is growing. The percentage of plastics are, and, and that we're, are for packaging is growing, you know, they think that it will actually, just this decade will eclipse all of the plastics that we've created before, ever. So just this decade will eclipse all of the plastics produced to date. And the, and the majority of that plastic that we're producing now is disposable um, plastic. It's packaging. So it's kind of a, a frightening kind of rate of growth, and that's the urgency in trying to take action. I think people feel the urgency of that increase. They can see it and feel the plastic kind of taking over. Susan, I just want to clarify, both for the audience here and at home who may be watching, did you say 100 billion plastic bags a year are used in the United States? Yes, um, that is according to the um, report that I took that from, which was from World Watch, World Watch Institute. Okay. I think people are using more outside of St. Louis Park, just from my own personal <laughs> <laughs> trip. Any other questions for Susan? Thank you. Thanks, Dan. That concludes the um, 
presenters and question and answer portion of this evening. Um, are there any other questions for anybody that we've heard from again? Yes, I, I was wondering if I could ask the Grocer Association. Uh, Jamie. Yes, Jamie. Uh, one more question. You had mentioned uh, two things. Well, you had mentioned one thing about the fact that St. Louis Park um, has some of the lowest use of plastic bags. And I might suggest, this is just a comment, That's not, this is not my question, that we actually are representing the will of our constituents, actually, because they don't want to use plastic bags, <laughs> yeah. but um, in, in even considering this. But the question is this. When the Star Tribune covered this issue, they interviewed folks at Trader Joe's, at Target, at some different uh, retail establishments that have uh, other locations, including California and places where there, ban there are bans. And what struck me was Target said, uh, we comply in 106 different municipalities with varying bans. The response was a little more ho-hum, frankly, than I expected. It was a little bit like, yeah, we get these bans and we figure it out. And I'm just wondering sort of what your thoughts are on that in terms of really a challenge, because obviously that's a lot of different cities around the country that some an entity like Target or others are complying with. And I can't, I can't speak on behalf of Target. They're not necessarily, I mean, Bruce, you may want to, I don't know if you want to talk, speak to that. Um, but I think. I have the wrong person. Yeah, up yeah. <laughs> that's okay, but I can speak to, you know, I don't, I don't, a lot of our organizations that we do represent are not necessarily nationwide um, retailers. And, and I will say that, again, when looking at the um, different ordinances, bans, fees, whatever that, that is determined, um, the proximity of those alternative shopping options still makes a difference. Okay. And that is, I think, one of the greatest concerns is that if you can m go five miles and have another choice, would, would you do that and may you do that? Will, will we comply with your wishes? Of, of course we will. Do you know? And, and so maybe that's a little bit of the laissez-faire attitude is that, you know, we're, we're seeing this, we're used to this, and, and we may do this. I will also say that in, in a lot of our folks that we work with, we're still very Minnesota-grown companies, and mm -hmm. they're not necessarily doing this all across the nation. So I Thank think you. that is another point. That's helpful. Bruce? Uh, Council Member, I think uh, your question is great because it would be great for you to have some of those conversations with individual retailers offline. I think those would be great conversations. One thing I can generalize is I think you're going to find retailers are definitely willing to have the conversation and they're going to agree with you on some of the environmental things we've talked about. I mean, I'm very encouraged by tonight's conversation because I think uh, it sounds like everybody sort of has the same goal. Just how we get there might be a little different. So I think those would be some great individual conversations with retailers. Okay. Council Member Sanger. I have a question for Mr. McElroy from the restaurants. Um, most of the comments we've had that indicated some concern with the plastic bag ban address the question of cost. You addressed a different question, which was perhaps what would be put in the bag is, how would you say it, sloppy, wet, hot, whatever. Um, and, I, and I, under, I can understand that, that that might be the case sometimes. So my question for you is, I guess twofold. One is, what alternatives have your members explored of different, potential different ways that their products could be carried out of the store um, other than a plastic bag? And kind of related to that is, there are numbers of times, like for example, when I have gotten um, food for carryout from a restaurant where it's not being put in a plastic bag at all, it is being put in a plastic container that is itself recyclable. Um, and recyclable, I mean in our uh, curbside recycling pickup. And so my question then is twofold. Can we, could more th um, of the restaurant's products be uh, transported in recyclable plastic or in some other means other than a plastic bag? And may I add, yep. styrofoam is probably not a good option right, right now. Right, <laughs> but, but but something that would something else that something would. I know about Dan is he wasn't going to say styrofoam. Yeah. <laughs> oh, your microphone. Make sure your microphone's on. Dan. Thank you. 
Um, you've asked a complex series of questions, so let me do my best to, to, uh, to address them. Restaurants are different, have, uh, there are a lot of different restaurants that have different uh, menu mixes, different kinds of foods they send home. There's a fair amount of experimentation going on in this world right now. Okay. Subway, for example, is piloting some uh, compostable bags made from PLA or polylactic acid, pioneered here in Minnesota by the Cargill Dow Partnership, often known as Nature Works. The problem with them is they're expensive, but they're environmentally responsible. We'll see how they work out in time. The options that we see most often are a, the no bag option, which works fine if you're getting one container. Um, the most common containers have been rigid polystyrene, which as you heard there, although it's recyclable, it isn't a good, a good market. There are options made from uh, PPE or HDPE, uh, and if you're just buying one thing, that's pretty easy. But when you're buying one thing that then comes with sauce and chopsticks and rice, or there are three or four people in the family and there's more than one container, balancing individually recyclable containers isn't a very good option. So they end up going in something. We've looked at reusable restaurant bags, and from a sanitation point of view, the cloth bags don't work very well in the restaurant world because they get Kung Pao sauce on them. The plastic bags, the it, it, customers don't tend to bring them back very often. The, in the restaurant world, we use 2.25 mils as a re reusable bag. They're fairly expensive. Um, if, in moderate quantities, they can be 25 to 40 cents a piece. Uh, it depends on the price point of what you're selling as to whether that's a good thing. We have other menus or uh, members experimenting with all sorts of other things as basic as wrapping leftovers in butcher paper and brown paper tape or aluminum foil and teaching servers to do origami so it comes home as a swan. Uh -huh. That's going to happen at higher price points. It's not likely going to happen on a $6 sandwich. Um, but the industry is interested in research. They're doing various things. Most complicated things is when things are messy or cold or hot or sloppy or if you're balancing multiple containers in a carryout order. Okay, thank you. Jake. Dan, after listening to you, I'm starving. <laughs> Between barbecue sauce and Kung Pao paper, and, or Kung Pao sauce and all the rest of it. I didn't uh, mean to make you hungry, Council That's right, you know what, yeah. It, it's, uh, that's not real hard with me, Dan. I, two things, one, Tom, can you tell us, the, I, I was just quick here trying to look, the compostable bags that the city provides through its curbside organics are made by a company called Bag to Nature. Do you know, Dan was talking about a number of compostable uh, materials, and the reason I ask is because, of course, I throw coffee grounds in there. There's all sorts of wet, sloppy stuff that goes in there. And I'm just curious, what are those made of? Which, which version of the alphabet that Dan was mentioning, <laughs> does anyone know? Kayla knows. Kayla knows. <laughs> Bag Kayla to knows Nature all. is the yeah, name of the good. company. It's it's not important, but I I, I was curious. Maybe staff yeah, can let me know afterwards. Scott, that would be a PLA curious. bag, would it not? Yeah. Okay. For the lay people, could and you give a little more information? Yeah. On that? The poly what was polylactic acid. acid, and those bags are certified compostable in, um, and they meet the state statute the ASTM testing, and they're also tested by the um, Bio Biodegra Biodegradable Products Institute. Wow. Uh, unrelated to this, but sort of related to something that, um, Bruce, that I think you raised, and, and it was in response to something that Ann had said, I think that engagement with businesses is is a really important piece of it. And I just wanted to point out in council, in the materials that were made available for this, Dan Miller, who was the president of Mulberry, is a dry cleaner here in St. Louis Park, had sent in a letter that was really asking a very specific question about the garment care industry and dry cleaners and were they going to be part of this or not. But I took the opportunity to call him to talk about what he's engaged in and interestingly enough they have switched to a completely biodegradable bag material for their garment care so I do think that this this piece of reaching out to businesses and finding out what they're doing and and how they're doing it and Dan has made a point of saying we want to be the most environmentally friendly dry cleaner in the Twin Cities and part of this is yes 
covering garments that have been cleaned is important, but we can do it without having to use the sort of thin mill plastics that most dry cleaners use. So I think I just want to echo what Ann had said and Bruce, what you had said about talking to the to the community because Dan's observations were really helpful to me to better help me understand so. Any other questions? Councilmember Bross. Uh, along the same lines, I was at a well-known uh, St. Louis Park establishment that serves Thai food this past week, and I talked to the owner and proprietor there about it, and she actually said that one person comes in there all the time just to get the plastic bags. And uh, I asked her, well, would you have an issue with adapting to this? And she said, no, we'll adapt. We'll figure something out. We already we don't use polystyrene at all. We have takeout containers that traditional Chinese food comes in, and they'll find a way to make it work. It's really about educating all of ourselves about doing what's healthy and sustainable as opposed to what's just cheap and easy. At least that's my personal point of view. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank everyone for participating tonight. Just to <coughs> run through the timeline, this is the first step in the city's process and uh, this process will continue through August. Uh, we expect a study session discussion in September and um, the council will uh, begin to look at the policy in November. So uh, city council and the staff will continue to publish public information and keep people informed. Thank you. I'd also like to echo that. Uh, first of all, I want, on behalf of the city council here, I want to thank all of the participants, especially the business communities for being open to this and, and willing to discuss it, our environmental advocates and our public servants also for coming out here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate the fact that hopefully there's an audience out there watching us too and the people that have shown up in attendance tonight as we learn about this issue. Uh, the City Council is going to be holding a similar panel discussion on polystyrene to-go containers on June 27th. July. I'm sorry, July 27th. And we'd like to ask our panelists to return to be involved in that discussion as well. So please consider that. Uh, after the completion of the panel discussions and subsequent check-in meetings with the Council, staff will be preparing a communication plan to begin to reach the public with information about the process and the opportunities that will be available to them to provide input to the council. Public listening sessions will be held separately for plastic bags in September and polystyrene in October. Both residents and businesses will be invited to these open forum listening sessions. I'd also encourage anybody in our audience to please feel free to email your comments to both city staff or members of the council. We want to hear from all of you what you think about this issue. Uh, again, we appreciate the input provided. We appreciate the interest in this subject matter tonight and the enthusiasm of all the stakeholders involved in this process. So thanks for being part of this conversation tonight.